This is an irreverent podcast. Check out irreverent.fm for shows from all our friends. First Corinthians warned you about the women with a loud mouth, and this podcast is just that. Here at the Speaking in Church podcast, we talk all about the regular people and the things that regularly happen to them in the evangelical church. It's a podcast about change, it's a podcast about seeking moral high ground, and it's a podcast for people who are just trying to deconstruct on the safe side. You can listen wherever you get your podcast, and if you want to be a guest, yes, you, regular person, you can be a guest on the Speaking in Church podcast. If you want to come on, just let us know. Hello and welcome to Exvangelical, a show exploring the world inside and outside the evangelical subculture. I'm your host, Blake Chastain. I know it's been a minute since we've had a new interview here on the show, but unfortunately that's just due to a number of scheduling conflicts and other things in my personal and professional life that uh, took priority over the last couple of months. So I apologize for that uh, unannounced hiatus, um, which I've addressed elsewhere, um, but I'm happy to share this episode that I recorded with Holly Laurent from the Mega Podcast. Holly was on the show back in 2019, which was a completely other type of world. So we catch up, we talk about her work on the Mega Podcast in the ensuing years, as well as her upcoming new satirical show called The Rise and Fall of Twin Hills, which will be coming out later this month, and it is a satirical uh Com- <laughs> uh, comedy uh, or uh, a take on the rise and fall of Marcel. Uh, so I hope you uh, enjoy this episode. It was really great to catch up with with Holly and understand um, what how things have, have uh, changed over the last few years for her uh, and her work. If you want to support my work here, you can do so over at postevangelicalpost.com. That is my newsletter that this show is now a production of. And uh, you can subscribe for free, or you can subscribe for $5 a month or $50 a year. I donate 25% of net revenue, and you can learn all about all of that, as well as my other writing and other things over at postevangelicalpost.com. All right, let's get into it. Hello and welcome to Exvangelical. Today I have with me a return guest, Holly Laurent, from the podcast Mega, as well as the upcoming podcast, The Rise and Fall of Twin Hills. Holly, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, Blake. I'm really excited to talk to you and see how much we have both changed and grown and evolved (laughs) and become very emotionally healed and mature, I'm very sure. (laughs) Yeah, something like that. Yeah, we actually talked a whole world and lifetime ago we talked in 2019 so this was before covid before the 2020 election before the january 6th insurrection and everything else that's happened since what so a world. it's that's a, a lot of ground to cover but so let's just check in and how has mega been going since we talked last this is your Im- improv satirical podcast about a fictional mega church and you have a ton of comedy comedy a-listers that come on your show and and do guest spots so how has that been in the last few years what a great question blake it's evolved like it has changed i think i used to be more precious about stuff and i've become a little bit more silly about it i used to really in the beginning i was very like okay it has to be very true to the world of a mega church and i know this world inside <laughs> and out and i've relaxed a little bit on that and, and i'm like at the end of the day it's a comedy podcast and we really want to make people laugh so i think we've gotten a little bit looser with it a little sillier all in the name of let's just really go for maximum laughs <laughs> because truly like that i want my comedy to hit hard and when i consume comedy as well as when i create it and and le- i really do believe in that thing of laughter being the best medicine and honestly as mega has continued the biggest feedback that i get from people usually is how therapeutic and helpful it feels to be able to laugh about some of this stuff and to be mm-hmm. able to find the levity and to have real kind of 
release on some things, maybe through laughter or just feeling that healing medicine of, of laughter. And I also have people contact me who say, I go through spurts where I can't listen to my gut because it bothers me. It hurts me. It upsets <laughs> me. And I'm like, I get it. I completely get it because I feel Is it, it because it's too to close me. to the truth? Is that why? Is it like, or? Yeah. And maybe even just hearing because we, we do play our characters to the top of our intelligence to really humanize these people who deeply believe and who take it literally mm -hmm. who are toxically positive and who are all these things who are biblically illiterate but also taking it literally right. is, can be such a harmful, toxic, dangerous point of view to come with. And sometimes even as I say things in character, as my character who, uh, my character Hallie expresses a lot of deeply ingrained misogyny inside her own point of view and stuff. And sometimes I really do feel when I speak in her voice, I sometimes feel cortisol fill my body. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think this is good for me. But it's also maybe a sign of growth that I'm even starting to notice. Like, oh, wow, my I'm physically responding to that. I That might be too, because since we last spoke, I've really brought the attention of my mind a lot more into the embodiment thing. Mm -hmm. I think maybe a lot of purity culture survivors or maybe that is geisty right now of embodiment get in your body and right. the fact that yeah. the fact that I found myself as a sensitive kid in an environment in a high demand and high control religion at an early age and looking around and I wonder if some of my honestly I just wonder if some of my neurodivergence and ADHD comes from this because I feel like I my experience of every human interaction is that I'm picking up about 20 percent of it and then I'm weaving together other things I'm noticing by being empathic and intuitive and just sensitive in the moment. I feel mm -hmm. like the content of what's being said, I'm picking up on about 20% and then I'm weaving the rest together from the other things I'm sensing and picking up. And I wonder if that's about what my little sensitive soul figured it could take way back when I arrived and was like, whoa, this is <laughs> this is a very intense environment of yeah. purity culture and being spanked and all of that stuff and demand and high control religion. Like when my soul did leap out of my body, I got so good at dissociating that now in adulthood, I'm like, okay, trying to get back into my body. And it's very rewarding in certain respects, but it's much more like challenging and painful yeah, than rewarding yeah. time being for the time being. Yeah. Yeah. That's really fascinating just because I, that's the truth and jest type thing that it can be so your fictional character hewing so close to yeah. the actions and beliefs of people that to, you might, you're playing this up in, in a sort of over the top sort of way, but that may be the normal behavior of someone. And that might be what is leading some people to say there are periods I can't listen to the show yeah. when I have to skip. And I do think there may be something there as far as, do you think that there is something there of being like that type of hypervigilance that a lot of people develop in these spaces that a lot of times you just know when something is going to activate your anxiety <laughs> and then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think activating an anxiety is a, is an apt way of saying it. And I, and I think maybe too, that's why I've loosened it a little bit because as much as I want it to be authentic to the world that it's satirizing. Also, I, Again, I don't want to be filling my body with cortisol or anyone sure. else's and really trying to have it be more fun. It's funny because when we first started doing live shows, we in, in the beginning, we really made it like a mega church service. And then we were like, oh, no, fuck that. And, and then <laughs> we did it. And then we did it much more variety show style, mm. just way more like comedic really like keeping the spotlight more on the comedic side of things. And then our latest iteration of the live show has been just panel style where we're just bringing in really fun comics and we're just improvising our asses off. And so that is getting really off the rails. And I'm like, huh, maybe that's apropos of where this is going. And what I've been doing with my character, Hallie, as well, is I'm really trying to slowly chip away at all of her certainty. Mm. And put her through that. And a lot of it is and challenges that are coming from her kids. Obviously, that's all like fictional. But mm. it's funny sometimes when we put stuff online on TikTok and stuff like I I just get attacked. But it's so funny because people on the right always attack, uh, always come to my character's defense and are like, what a good mom. If I if I put out some joke about I routinely go through my kids' cell phones to I'm, getting, I'm um, trying to learn what all the less, these kids aren't. It's funny. And all these people online, on the right will be like, you're such a good mom. And all these people on the left will be like, you are a 
you're an right abusive there. parent. You're a terrible mom. You should never. <laughs> and it's fun for me because I'm like, I'm a child free individual in real life. I got no dog in this fight. <laughs> <laughs> but I think as I've gone in, in the beginning, I think to an, another answer to your question of how has mega evolved, it's I do think that I've become way more specific in trying to target my character's point of view and the world of the mega church in general. And in general, I maybe the average American evangelicals that my indictment of them really is that for the most part, I find them to be pretty biblically and theologically illiterate. And yet they build their whole framework of reality based on this book that they really do not know what's in there. And they know some of what's in there, but I think the tradition of the Bible being relayed through a church service to what I think was originally illiterate congregants. And so they had to take the pastor's word for it. That kind of has remained the dynamic where people go to church and they learn like specific parts of what's in the Bible and what their pastor believes is the commentary on that. And then they go about their way. And, and even though now most of the population is not illiterate, I don't think they're really reading the Bible. They're just still taking other people's word for it. So as, as that has become more of my indictment on the culture at large, I've just tried to filter that into my character and really start to challenge the scaffolding that holds up her whole idea of reality. And I'm forcing my character to get into what does the Bible actually say? Because even as I learn, even as I'm me, Holly, in real life, learn things like, oh, wow, most of what I believed or learned about Lucifer or Satan, that's from Paradise Lost. That's actually not from the Bible. And like, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. wow. What does the Bible actually say? Oh, wow. Huh. <laughs> There's a lot that it doesn't say. Where did I get all of that? Big one this week that I just real that I just discovered is I was having a conversation with a bunch of people a around the mega verse. <laughs> oh, I don't want to even say that. I don't want to say anything even close to metaverse. Blech. But I was talking to some uh, other people who liked maybe deconstructing the belief system that we were raised with. Mm -hmm. We were talking about what do you think Jesus did in the three days? And, oh, I was I always heard that in between Good Friday and Easter morning, he had he went to hell and was doing like this epic battle with Satan and defeating him and whatever. Yeah. But, and then went to look for that in the Bible. And wait, why do we think that? And where is that in the Bible? And what does the Bible actually say? And then, of course, when you really get into it, it's like, whoa, because the Bronze Age people believed in a three tiered universe that heaven was up in the sky. Earth was here where we are and then hell was beneath the earth and it was like a tiramisu and that was it mm. now that we have satellites and stuff and we know <laughs> that we're on a sphere and that there is a that we're f shooting through the cosmos and blah 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 it does it, it gives me lots of juice where then i can have my character hallie have her kids be like so yeah mom when jesus blasted off at the Mount of Olives <laughs> and ascended into heaven. Like, where did he go? Did he shoot up into the Earth's atmosphere? Because it gets cold. And there's not oxygen. Did it burn up his physical body? Where is he? Where is heaven? Like metaphysically, where is heaven? Where do we think it is? Is it because Jesus always said it's here and it's now and it's on planet Earth <laughs> because he didn't even have a concept of a soul because that was before the Greeks even got to that concept. So that also was why obviously Jesus had to have so much proof of a physical resurrection, blah, blah, blah. But the more I do to educate myself, the more I can feed that in and into the world of the show. Because I sometimes I do think of like, how will we end it? What will we do to our characters? And so I'm trying to play a really long game while also just having fun and making yeah. funny episodes. <laughs> yeah. So your fictional character is maybe getting those first seeds of maybe some eventual what we now call deconstruction and everything. And those initial seeds of questioning or uncertainty. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Just that I, I think as I've had conversations with people around deconstruction or around not being a person of faith any longer and the emotional experience of that and everything, I feel one of the biggest things people always want to know is what was it that gave you the wrong impression of Christianity and of the God of the Bible that is about love? How did mm -hmm. you come to a place of believing that this is something that creates harm. And they always want to know, who was it? Was it, did you get into Sam Harris? Was it Glenn and Doyle? Who was it? What was it? What did you read? And I'm always yeah. like, I'm always like, it's the Bible. I, I read the Bible. And when I read the Bible and came to understand it, and I, I have no use of it anymore, I, 
if you don't use it, you lose it. But I took Koine Greek so that I could. Same here. <laughs> yeah. So you could translate the New Testament and then you can yep. get into the weeds on all of that and about translation and different translations and yeah. meaning and context and all of that. And I think what I have realized is that it is indeed my biblical literacy that was the the final Jenga piece that got mm-hmm. pulled out that toppled the whole dang thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what were you yeah, going to say? Yeah. Oh, I'm no. So curious I, what, I was, I forget what I, which path I was going to take us down there. That's okay though. We'll come back to it if it's important. I'm curious as you've developed this show, how it appeals and how people that are in the comedy scene relate to this type of project. Because I think when we spoke, you had launched this as an independent podcast. You've since joined like a comedy podcast network. And one thing I always admire about at least some types of comedians, the comedians that quote unquote make it or whatever is a lot of times they, they form troops or yeah. you worked at, you were at second city. Like a lot of times they, they succeed together. Yeah. And so yeah. they come up together depending upon which generation you're in, you might associate different groups of comedians with one another. And often comedians are very deeply considered thinkers because their bread and butter is poking fun at society. Yeah. They think about it. Yeah. And they make observations. That's what comedy is. Yeah. Uh, the evangelical subculture is so specific and there is a lot of it that is so specific to having lived in it. I'm curious how many mm-hmm. people how many comedians have a a lived experience of it and then may have left or aren't practicing. Nobody really talks about, excuse the word practicing, but not evangelicals. Oh yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but then the people that maybe, I'm also curious, like the comedians that you've worked with or had on as guests that don't have any experience, yeah. but still turn in a really impressive performance because of just the general cultural knowledge of these evangelical norms and stuff. And so I'm just curious how that's yeah. played out as you've continued to develop this and invited m- more and more comedians on your show. Yeah, what a great question, Blake. I would say a lot of our guest comics have Catholicism in their background, but are mm. no longer practicing. Some are like, oh, yeah, I grew up in a Baptist church. It To me, it feels almost like 30% ex-Catholics, 30% ex-Protestants. And the rest are people who are like, yeah, man, I don't know anything about that world. And I'm, inter- <laughs> I'm kind of just improvise about it. But I think the way that people in comedy view the mega angle with our podcast, at least my experience of a lot of the great comedy folks that we've had on is I think they view it as it's a language like like specificity in comedy is so gold golden because there is a universality in terms of relate the more specific someone is the more universally people will relate to it even if just in its specificity and so i feel like um because i can speak evangelical it's just really ripe for comedy in terms of the specificity so i think the comedy folks who come in and out of the world of mega I think they like that because they're like, oh, it's just such a specific voice that it it's really easy. The comedy flows pretty easily from that rock because the voice is so specific. So I think they think of it as, oh, cool, funny angle. And so we all will just speak that language and get in flow together inside of that point of view. And then we just lift our legs and let that stream of, of comedy carry us right on down that river using the evangelical speak Mm -hmm. example of somebody who came on with no church background, who was really nervous is when Cecily strong came on, Cecily is from, she was Saturday night live and now she's doing the Schmigadoon or Schmicago, Schmicago. I can't say that word. Yeah. Yeah. It's an (laughs) Apple TV series, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, when she came on, she's so funny and we were friends from second city. And when she came on, she was like, I have no church background. And anytime somebody says that, I'm always like, oh, you're so lucky. (laughs) I'm like, oh, your parents did you such a favor. (laughs) They set you up like a few football fields ahead of me. I'll tell you that because I'm still, (laughs) I'm such a late bloomer because I'm still trying to recover from some of this, so much of this religious trauma. But she was like, I'm nervous because I just don't know the lingo. And we always were like, oh man, we've got that covered. You just be in character and think of it as like a, 
an interview in character and anywhere you go, we will follow you. And anywhere this goes is fine with us. It's a okay. And then I get really editorial with them too. I'll go in and clean them up and take out the laughs. And if there's an, if an inappropriate joke snuck in that I don't stand by, cut that out, (laughs) all that. But, but she, hers was really fun because we were just like, we usually tell people like, what's a job you've had delivering papers or working at a bagel place or a sommelier or whatever. And then we'll just be like, great. Mega Church has all those things. We'll have the, the Mega Church now. <laughs> it's funny, the world yeah. of the show now, we have a pizza delivery is coming out of this mega church. There's <laughs> everything. There's a like an aquatic ministry. I think the campus now has a the fictional campus now has a Olympic sized swimming pool. All the bells and whistles. But yeah. but Cecily was like, I just want to base a character on this YouTube, this funny YouTube I saw like years and years ago where a pastor was sending a cordless mic around the for people's testimony and this woman grabbed the mic and she was talking about how God saved her from a really low point. She was trying to describe the low point and um, <laughs> the pastor started trying to like pull the mic out of her hands and she was like, oh, no, and she's grabbing the mic. And she was like, I was so low. I was, she said something like, I was sucking dick. And then he, he's trying to pull it. He's trying to pull it. And before he could pull it out of her hand, she goes, after sucking dick, she goes, I was so low. I was licking balls. <laughs> oh, God. And he's trying to pull that out of her hands. <laughs> so, and Cecily showed us this clip and we were laughing so hard. We were like, yeah, be her. And so she just played that, that type of a character. And so then the challenge was really in our character's court to try to salvage the interview the whole time because she ended up playing somebody who came out of prison and she had been saved through Twin Hills prison ministry. Mm. Then she learned mm-hmm. that there are meals at the church. So she was just basically there for meals. And and that's a really funny episode, actually. I love that episode <laughs> now that I'm remembering it. But yeah, so w- when someone doesn't have a background in it, we're just like, okay, then let's just be funny. You're a funny person. Yeah. Let's just be funny. And we... We're like, we'll take care of you. We'll take really good care of you because that's the whole point of improv. Exactly like what you said. In fact, part of, I think, why improv is my nearest and dearest of all the arts and the thing that the way I identify, I don't know how to identify on the spectrum of believer, agnostic, atheist, secular, humanist. What I don't have any of that, I just identify as an improviser maybe (laughs) today. (laughs) But that's the beauty of improv. And I remember part of why I fell so hard for it in the beginning was because of the tradition and the the ritual that we have before every show where you, everyone in the ensemble touches each other on the back, looks each other in the eye and says, I've got your back. I've got your back. I've got your back. I've got your back. And that really got me because I think that's truly as a human being, as a sensitive soul, that's all I'd ever wanted to hear in life was somebody be like, I've got your back. One of my friends, mm-hmm. my longtime improv group, one of my friends, Mike, he would always, when we were doing backs, he would always, instead of saying, instead of saying, I got your back, he would always say, um, if you do something weird out there, I'll do something weirder. And, <laughs> and I was like, that's a really cool, that's a really cool invitation too, to be like, to be like, let's go. If you jump, when improvisers are together, and this is the beauty you were talking about in terms of it being an ensemble, when improvisers are together, like our DNA is to watch for who is leaping without a net, who is taking the biggest risk. And then we come around them and fuck yeah, we're like, we will make that work. We make the net appear by like, supporting every choice. Like wherever you go, I will go with you. You will never find yourself out on a limb and then realize you're there alone. If this branch goes down, I'll be on this limb with you. That's really, that really appeals to me. So it, so we really let people know when they come on, we're like, Hey man, I'm trying to get Brian McLaren to come on right now. I love him so much. And I'm like, we'll take such good care of you. You'll laugh the whole time and it'll be easy. We will take care of you. We will cover all the stuff so that you can just be present and have fun. And I do think that's another thing that improv is asking of me and it's why it has called to me in this life is because really truly it's mostly at its core it's about being present and listening um that's something i need so badly as a Mm. really anxious person yeah and and as a person who's typically a pretty bad listener and no a great debt of gratitude to comedy because i do feel like it rushed into any of the kind of holes in my heart i had from That's one of the tricky things with Christendom is that, especially the evangelical high demand type, is that it's not just a nice place where good people go on Sunday for community and whatever. It's like demanding that its tentacles are in every part of your life and every part of every bit of every relational dynamic and the way you go through your entire day from beginning to end, blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah, um, yeah. And I found c- community in all of that in in comedy. And I know that's a really painful part of people when they discover that they have become an evidence based person instead of a faith based person. Is that a lot of times then they find themselves alone, which is incredibly hard because as a species we're so wired for belonging. And but that's another reason why some of the shame that comes along with some of the belief systems of evangelicalism is so painful because that shame is the opposite of belonging, which we're wired for. So and then mm. we all just walk around with all these disorders and, and trying yeah. to get the right pills to feel the right way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's that bringing, coming back to a lot of us, bring different, uh, different pathways to things like embodiments. As you mm. mentioned, it's sort of in the zeitgeist. I've had embodiment coaches on this show, like, yeah. uh, and some of them and they're all working in parallel or together. And because of the internet, we find all these different ways to it. But yeah, yeah, there's this sociological term called a total institution, which is just like you were saying, like any type of thing, like, like white evangelicalism that, that lays claim to all these different parts of your life, whether, you know, your social life, your yeah. mental life, your spiritual life, all these things, they call that total institution. The other, another one would be Mormonism, that sort of thing. And I actually learned it from a former Mormon who was studying this in grad school. Fascinating. Um, total institutionalism? Yeah, it's yeah, it's called a it's called a total institution. So any type total of institution. community and that tries to claim your entire self. It's mm. it seems from what you, the way you talk about your own experience with an improv, you had a healthier example of community. Yeah, than exactly. One that wasn't based on maintaining a, per, a certain type of ideological purity or any other sort of Exactly. Thing, something that recognizes more of your humanity than yeah. what most of us find in evangelical spaces. Have there yeah. been any periods in the show, like where it's become, it's primarily a satirical show, but have there been moments of like surprising sincerity? Because like satire cuts the other way, right? There's this writer, he primarily writes comics, Mark Russell, but he's also written, he wrote a comedic retelling of the Bible called God is Disappointed in You. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I, you would probably really love his stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. And he also, like, his writing also incorporates this amazing ability. Like, he uses satire and sincerity in this really interesting way that, like, no one does oh. social commentary like yeah. him. But I'm curious, like, within the context of having a comedy podcast where the expectation is you're going to laugh. <laughs> yeah. You're, th- that's the product you are. And clearly you bring a lot of sincerity to your development of the character. Is there, does any of that ever come into the show or do you feel like that? Or is that just an inappropriate place for sincerity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Sometimes I feel like true sincerity, like creates a black hole where comedy goes to die And so I really want to get into that comic you're talking about, because when sincerity and satire can commingle and make each other stronger instead of negating one negates the other, that is fascinating to me. And yeah, there are so many moments. I don't, that's such a great question. Blake, God bless you. God bless you. (laughs) It's such a interesting, huh? I really like the door you just opened in my brain. I think my big aha sincere moments often exist in the research that I'm doing to continue Mm. to challenge my character's point of view. Gotcha. Although to be, I don't know, it could just be my mood lately or my, my threshold for uncomfortable growing pains lately. But I, I, it's interesting. I just did a, an experimental episode where I played my character's son, Day, who is a skeptic and who is in the process of deconstructing. And he hijacked the, I, I play the teenage boy <laughs> and he hijacked our podcast and interviewed an atheist for the first time on Mega. <laughs> and it wasn't a, it wasn't a really funny episode because I was, I was interviewing Hemet Mehta, who is an atheist. And a he's friendly a, atheist. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's wonderful. Yeah. You know him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's not a comic. He's a, a beautiful person and an incredible thinker. And my character day is very sincere 
and was just like asking Hemet a bunch of questions about, okay, let's talk about original sin and the idea that is it, is it psychological abuse? Does it fit into the category of like in, in interpersonal relationships when someone tells you like you're fucked up and I'm the only one who can save you? It's like really abusive. My character, the teenage boy Day, was like talking about things like that sincerely with Hemet. Of is this considered like psychological? Abuse? So we're talking sincerely about these things that I find to be fascinating conversations. But when we looked at the numbers of that episode, we were like, oh, it wasn't a bunch of laughs and it didn't do as well. And so I was like, maybe is that better for a Patreon thing or whatever? Because I'm like, ooh, I, I really like that conversation and find it really stimulating. But my co-host, Greg, he's, yeah, but at the end of the day, we are a comedy podcast. So maybe right. I need to take those sincere conversations <laughs> elsewhere. I'm not sure. But but my, a lot of yeah. my aha moments come in the research. And I really, I sometimes I don't know how much longer I'll do that research. Because sometimes, sometimes I do find such beautiful, redeeming things in scripture. And I am remind as I research, but and I'm reminded not to throw the baby out with the bathwater or I worry that I'm turning my back on love because of one bad rom-com and that one bad rom-com would be fundamentalist white evangelicalism. But sometimes I've realized re recently I've been a little bit more of the mind that like I don't I don't want this to sound too harsh, but sometimes lately I'm like. I don't care. Like so, sometimes part of me is I need to really deeply understand exactly what the Bible does say about homosexuality and understand it in context and understand it in all these ways and know exactly what it says because it doesn't say what we think it says. And the writers of the Bible had a much different idea. They There, there was not the ideas of queerness that we have today and all of that trans and non-binary and all the, bi, all the letters in the LGBTQIA plus thing, like the Biblical writers did not, they were not thinking of it the same way we were. And so sometimes we are. But so I've gone through long periods because of my podcast, Mega, where I'm doing all this research and I really want to understand and I really want to understand it in context and I really want to have that knowledge. And lately I find myself more and more coming to a place where I'm like, you know what, personally, and, and maybe again, this is like burnout or something, just my yeah. emotional experience as a little human being. But I'm like, man coming to a point where I'm like, I, I don't care what that right. book has to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I and I think that's natural. I do it, think that's natural. Right. Yeah. I think you've talked to a uh, host of one of the other, to, to the host of DRCK, Adrian. And when I had him on the show a while back, he described it as just basically like a, what do you say? Like a cosmic shrug or something like that. Yeah. That's a great, <laughs> like, yeah. He said something to that. Degree. And I relate to that. To me, the, the reasons why it works internally is less interesting now than how it impacts people. Uh, to me, that's yeah, same. like I, I used to care about, I used to be fascinated with understanding God and what that meant. But then yeah. now I'm more interested in what does this understanding of God mean for this person? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I really um, respect that. I really relate to that. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 But it's, I, it does seem like a natural shift, especially if you spent decades obsessed mm -hmm. with it to begin with, yeah. right? Like and, when is enough? Yeah. And <laughs> I hear a lot of people talk about their journey of healing or deconstruction or whatever you want to call it, or grappling with their own religious trauma or whatever. Sometimes the metaphor of a bad breakup comes up of hard to still engage conversations with Christians who are still committed because it's like they're dating your ex who really beat you senseless for a long time who now they're saying like no he's great <laughs> and you're like oh wow and yeah it's really hard and to be like oh that that person caused me so much harm and now it sounds like you have this loving great beneficial relationship and i think if i do stick with that breakup metaphor a little bit i think about like my worst breakup where there was a day when i was so deeply heartbroken and rocked to my core so deeply that I couldn't imagine being over it, ever being anything other than the complete and utter devastation that I was at the time. And if I look at the progress of how I moved on from that bad breakup in that relationship, there was a long time where I would still be processing things in relation to that 
relationship or to that Mm -hmm. breakup. And I'm still processing it and still thinking about that person and still wanting to understand things and put it in context, much like the way I approach the Bible, trying to understand it in context. And what was I supposed to learn from it? And what is, Mm. what is the benefit of having that? And what, why did it happen? And why did, and what to learn and all that stuff. And in terms of that specific breakup that now is so long ago that it honestly like rarely crosses my mind. Mm. So wonderful compared to the pain that once was for me. Right. Now, even I've had people bring it up and be like, how are you with that when you see them? And what is that? And are you okay? And almost laugh because I'm like, oh, I'm so okay. I, it's not even on my mind. Thank mm-hmm. goodness. And I think maybe that's a little bit of what I'm starting along for in terms of my human experience. And I'm really going to try to blow out Mega and get as many laughs as I can out of it before it ends, because maybe I need to get to that place where it's so far behind me. I don't need hugs about it anymore. And maybe I never will. And I also recognize, even as I'm saying this, I'm like putting it into a destination of I have arrived, I have healed, which we know is not a linear process. And the things that I used to be angry about and then started laughing about and was like, oh, wow, look at me laughing about it. I'm totally over it. And then a year (laughs) later, I'm like fucking furious again about it. I'm like, oh, wow, (laughs) no wonder there. I thought that was gone. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think those cycles are pretty um, very relatable for a lot of folks, especially listening to this show, just given the degree of what (laughs) power and influence that white evangelicalism still has over our broader society and where they've driven the country in the last several years. So that, that sort of, that cycle can even be activate, can be like reignited just with the news. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I just started, I'm going to spend, evidently you have to spend every last penny you ever can scrape together to get help from the psycho psychology and psychiatry community about this stuff. But I am like, okay, I guess I have to invest every last dime I ever make in this journey I'm on to try to really heal from some of this stuff. And so I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm actually in treatment right now with a psychiatrist for PTSD. And I am also getting real wild, Blake. And I'm working with a somatic, a psychologist who specializes in somatic breath work therapy that is trying to release trauma from the body. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to suck because I'm not the scream into a pillow type. I'm always like, no, nah, I'm not going to do anything weird. And I think that this breathing stuff is going to be that. But I also, I'm, I'm, I want to release some of this stuff. If it can be released, I want to release mm-hmm. it. Because what I can tell right now on a deep emotional level of my human experience is that I am very easily still triggered by things with family and church stuff. (laughs) As much as I would like to be like, oh, I laugh at it. I'm all better. Really, maybe I'm, again, I might be patting my own back or just trying to give myself some sense of agency inside of the pain that I'm currently in because I keep saying it's got to be growing pain. Like it must mean that I am leveling up in some way Hmm. or standing. And a big thing happened, Blake, since the last time we talked, the last time we talked, I was just in the early years of coming out of the closet publicly with the way I believe in the world of I am not a I am not a believer. I am I do not subscribe to the I, I started because I used to always protect it, even though I was like at Second City, obviously, and like doing comedy. So I still publicly I never said anything that would quote unquote upset my parents. And I had in that hurdle and the last time we spoke, I was being very public about it and yet had never had the like full blown eyeball to eyeball in no uncertain terms conversation about it with my parents, which has since happened recently, which is also mm. probably a little bit of why I'm raw. But I will tell you what, Blake, somebody recently was telling me that maybe this is just their theory, but that thing that you ruminate about constantly all day, that conversation you keep rehearsing in your head that if I do mm-hmm. say this and it's going to go this way, all, whatever that thing, whatever it is for you. Yeah. It's functioning like your higher power. And when I heard that, I was like, whoa, I don't like that <laughs> at all. I don't want this conversation of me being completely honest and my true authentic self and no longer self-abandoning and with my parents and whatever. And I had gone through the conversation one million times in my head and it finally happened. And I didn't know if it ever would. And I didn't, and I don't even know. If it should, I don't know. I don't know if it was good or bad, but it happened and I survived and I hope maybe 
through it, I showed that little inner child inside of me that leapt out of my body so long ago (laughs) and that I'm trying to get back in my body. Maybe I earned some trust with her by doing that. Mm. Have you seen Force, Force Majeure, that movie? No, I haven't. Are you familiar with it? It's it's basically the one line on it is that it's this it's a French movie, but this couple is skiing in the Alps with their kids and they're sitting out on this lovely terrace for lunch in the Alps and an avalanche starts so fast that it's like you have 1.2 seconds to know what to do because like you're about to be buried wow. while having lunch on this terrace. And the and it's one of the early scenes in the movie and the wife throws herself onto their two children and mm-hmm. the husband darts away instantaneously. And mm. the rest of the movie is the two of them, be, of her being like, whoa. Mm. Dude, yeah, what just happened? You left. And I felt, and I think about that movie Force Majeure a lot because I've started mm. to, as I've become more and more aware of my tendency to self-abandon, I think of that scene of, okay, the avalanche is coming. And so in the conversation where I really, in no uncertain terms, really spoke my truth to my parents. It, I feel like in that moment, I was on that terrace and the avalanche was coming. And I feel like I threw myself on little Holly. And I was like, I will not fucking leave you again. And if mm. that's the only thing that comes from this really difficult conversation I'm having that feels like a full blown avalanche I'm being buried under, I am strong mm-hmm. enough to crawl out of this. I have, yeah. I have got the support system in place and all of that. But honestly, Blake, I feel like, and I am not being prescriptive for anyone because I don't know if, I don't know about these conversations and if they should happen or not. I don't know for anybody. But for me, it, I don't even know if it was the right thing, but it's the thing that did happen. Mm. To be honest, it almost feels like I do have a little bit of a rite of passage from it. I And I don't know what door I did just walk through. I don't know where I am now. Mm-hmm. I do feel like I crossed some kind of threshold. <laughs> and it's really raw. And But I survived so far so good. And I, yeah, and I can give myself the grace of time to process it and yeah yeah does that make sense (laughs) making sense this is all okay (laughs) yeah no that i can certainly relate and i know i'm certain that lots of people can relate to the degree to which family and faith often commingle and and a a significant part of your (laughs) belonging and acceptance is based on based on whether you maintain the same type of faith or belief and yeah, it's such a, it's such a individual thing. Like it depends on the family system. It depends on the person, Yeah, but sometimes it, it does have, even if it isn't inevitable, sometimes clearing the air can help. And that's great that you were able to do it with both your parents. Yeah. You, even if it was understandably very difficult, but yeah. With that. Yeah. And then, and I lay in bed and I'm like, oh. Does that cause them so much pain? Did I hurt them? Do they deserve the compassion of just don't put it in their face like that or whatever. But for the first time ever, when I was having that thought, I heard uh, another voice, which is my own, that was like, you deserve compassion too, Holly. You deserve somebody like thinking about what that's like for you, even Mm -hmm. if it's just you, like acknowledging that that was really hard and I deserve compassion too. Because I think coming up as a kid in evangelical, white evangelicalism, my default is always going to be to people please and to assume that I'm wrong. Even just leveling up in that way and being like, no, I'm a grown ass woman. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and the people pleasing has gone on long enough. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hey everyone. Thanks for listening to Exvangelical. I wanted to let you know a few ways you can help support the show. The most direct way to do that is by subscribing to the Post Evangelical Post at postevangelicalpost.com. That is my newsletter that is available for free or by upgrading to a paid subscription at $5 a month or $50 a year. You'll get access to ad-free podcast feeds, exclusive writing and additional podcasts, and more published over at my Substack. You can also support the show by leaving a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And there is also merch available. And you can find links to all of that over at postevangelicalpost.com slash support. Thanks very much. 
1 Corinthians warned you about the women with a loud mouth, and this podcast is just that. Here at the Speaking in Church podcast, we talk all about the regular people and the things that regularly happen to them in the evangelical church. It's a podcast about change. It's a podcast about seeking moral high ground. And it's a podcast for people who are just trying to deconstruct on the safe side. You can listen wherever you get your podcast, And if you want to be a guest, yes, you, regular person, you can be a guest on the Speaking in Church podcast. If you want to come on, just let us know. I can relate to that as some, as someone who has a show that's about belief and, and changing belief. Like when it comes to those like close relationships, you never, sometimes you don't know what they're thinking and sometimes you avoid it. Sometimes you can't, but that's a very inside baseball thing from one podcaster to another. Yeah. That, like you're known for this this thing that may poke fun at something that someone you care yeah. for very deeply uh, yeah really yeah. still sincerely believes in yeah and my and dad that's... is the pastor of a mega church <laughs> <laughs> and it's so weird i will smoke a joint in the bathtub and stare at the ceiling and go oh my god my dad and i are both still <laughs> vocationally living off of the story of Jesus, Mm. (laughs) just from opposite sides. And I'm like, whoa. And that's one of the things too, that I've been asking any atheist I talked to recently, where I'm like, so atheism, even in its very name, still centers deity and that, that belief structure. And yeah, it does that keep you at the point in the breakup where you're still obsessing about your ex? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, and I really want to get to the point where I'm like, who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who there's def- <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely that that strain of atheism, especially I think that the kinds that are known as like atheist bros <laughs> <laughs> online and bro is a non-gendered term in that use who just want to throw their disbelief in your face, just like evangelicals want to throw their belief in your face. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So what's it been like doing to to pivot diff- to into a different different line of questioning? What's it been like to do live shows mm-hmm. and take your act on the road as a po- comedy podcast and really have perform these things live and meet people potentially after the fact? Every time you've been in my area, unfortunately, I've traveled. I've been somewhere else, so uh-huh. I haven't had a chance to come to your show yet. But, but what has that experience been like taking the show on the road? It's so fun. Performing live is my favorite, truest, deepest love. And it's been really fun just because at this point, Greg and I, my co-host, we just know the characters so well inside and out. And so it's so cinchy to just jump up and improv and improvise and play. And it's funny because I will hear things I'm such a verbal processor. I will hear myself say things as myself or in character and I'll go, oh, whoa, I didn't know I thought <laughs> that. And so I love the live shows for that because in the live shows, we're much more on the razor's edge and you can fall off and really eat shit and be like, oh, God damn it. Ah. And I love that. Whereas mm-hmm. in the podcast, I can be like, oh, I flubbed that joke. That sucks or whatever. I'm going to edit that out. Mm-hmm. Moments in the live show where as I'm going, I will feel my podcast brain kick in and be like, oh, I don't know if I can land this the way I'm barreling with this improvised joke right now. I might not be able to land it. And my podcast brain will be like, it's okay. I'll just rewind. And then I'll be like, no, I'm on the razor's edge. I'm live right now. I can't, I have to, what comes out of my mouth is what we will have to deal with in the moment. And (laughs) so it's good to, to have that too, to keep me sharp and not let me get lazy with the rewind and delete. And, and I'm in a, I'm in a class right now. I'm in a 12 week class right now called embodied sexuality by that is being led by a researcher who has done all of her work in specifically 2000 years of purity culture that has produced the modern day white woman, the white female product of purity culture is basically what this class research is about. And the 2000 years of purity culture and its tentacles being so irrevocably completely linked to racism. And, and because of that class, like I was doing a live mega show recently in LA and I heard myself say, 
purity culture doesn't create rape culture. Purity culture creates pure women. And as I heard myself say that, I was like, oh, I didn't oh, know I thought that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then I, ha- so it produces fun moments like that for me where I'm like, oh, I have to look into that. <laughs> yeah. And it's also really fun to just get a bunch of really funny people together and just really have fun. It's also so fun because with podcasting, you don't get any immediate feedback or sometimes any feedback at all. You won't hear anything right. about certain episodes that you put out and you're like, was that good? Does it have an impact? Is it making a difference? Does it matter? And when you do <laughs> live stuff and the audience is with you and there's that immediacy and the reciprocity and you feel them responding in the moment, to me, it's so joyful. It's so joyful. An anxious person, mm-hmm. I always go into those shows just like, I'm stressed, I'm scared, I'm stressed, I'm nervous, I'm stressed, I the pressure's on. And then I always leave the show being like, that was so fun, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I always go into the show being like, I'm never doing this again. I leave the show being like, more. (laughs) That's awesome. And and it's interesting, too, because we have Mega is about to, on May 20th, next month, Mega is about to launch a spinoff miniseries called The Rise and Fall of Twin Hills that is a parody of a big podcast that came out, I think, last (laughs) year, but I don't know what time is anymore. um, (laughs) Yeah. About Mark Driscoll and the epic explosion Mm. of a mega church that dissolved in that, that podcast chronicling that torrid affair was called the rise and fall of mars hill and when i listened mm-hmm. to that i was like oh this is just begging for us to parody this so we're doing the rise <laughs> and fall of twin hills and it's coming out and i'm really excited about it because i feel like it's a cool next chapter in terms of how this is evolving because in the way that my character is really chipping away at biblical illiteracy greg's character he plays gray's character is really chipping away at the kind of capital, like the late stage capitalistic and commercial like engine of white evangelicalism, Mm -hmm. sort of putting away at it from that angle. Mm -hmm. And so this spinoff series is much more getting into that, into the like the actual money. I mean, like Mark Driscoll so spectacularly exploded a mega church that had regional campus sites, thousands and thousands of people, blah, 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 blah. And he's just immediately restored and he's now leading a new church after having epically toxically exploded the last one. So we're taking that on, we're taking that head on and really finding some, the rise and fall of Twin Hills is going to be like, it's, we do not hold back. And I think with Mega, we really do try, we do love the characters we're playing and we don't punch down at individual believers. We are really intentional about comedically only and philosophically only punching up at the power systems that, you know, Mm -hmm. are oppressive and are harmful and are powerful and are wealthy. And the way that white evangelicalism is powerful and wealthy and damaging, that's, we play to the top of our intelligence in mega. And, but I think a lot of our swipes and swings and punches are really more lighthearted and in lighthearted at the power structure, mm-hmm. the rise and fall of Twin Hills. Oh my gosh. I'm a little bit nervous because I'm like, damn, I, it feels really risky to me because we're like, at this point, I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Let's go all the way. Like, these, <laughs> I'm like, let's go. Cause the, it, cause the main thing, especially with risky comedy is being able to articulate your target. And do you stand by a joke if it's hitting a certain target, right. for instance, yeah. if the target is trans kids, I do not stand by that joke because <laughs> that is a that is causing harm to a really disenfranchised like people group. I'm not. <laughs> but um, but the jokes I am willing to make and the punches that I'm willing to swing this time is really coming straight for that Jesus and John Wayne type of authoritarian oppressive regime of white evangelicalism that we're really going for. And I think it's really funny too. I think it, I really, I'm excited about it because I think it's funny and I think it's risky. And it, to be honest with you, I feel a little bit scared to put it out. So I know that we're on the right track because it mm-hmm. really scares me. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that that's going to be a very fun listen just because of, yeah, the rise and fall of Mars Hill had, had a lot of listeners and also, a lot of a lot of people who took issue with, with their oh okay sorry I'm seeing a lot of weirdness on my video that that's throwing me off. Oh yeah, I sometimes apologize. the video on Riverside does get all wild. It did that to me too, but it, it usually never hurts the audio. Yeah, sorry okay. about that. It just I saw You're myself good. and then I went into slow mo. <laughs> it was very strange. <laughs> Is this working? <laughs> Anyways, sorry. Let me take two there. It'll be very interesting to to listen to that just because that show was very much 
trying to apply that that narrative podcast type thing to Mars Hill and and it got a lot of press. And so I'm excited to see see your take on it and the way in which you you parody it and make the various commentary. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because Mark Driscoll's not a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Just, and uh, he's, it's funny. I don't know if you've, he blocked me on Twitter years ago and Twitter is terrible now anyways. Yeah. Uh, because in the Elon era, it's essentially unusable, but at least yeah. for me. Yeah. But well, congrats, the way in man. which you he's... got Mark to block him. Let's go. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I called him out. I, yeah, I had something about one of his plagiarism charges. I oh, wow. <laughs> asked him about it and he wasn't happy well, about that. I'm sure um, he's excited about chatbot GPT because that's going to generate some real great sermons that he can't get, um, that he can't get copyright infringement <laughs> for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm just um, also going to blame the AI alien that's going to devour us in the next five years. I blame that on Mark Driscoll too. <laughs> You know what? <laughs> Fuck Mark Driscoll. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean Fucked, or however you say his name. I'll always say it, Sean Fucked. <laughs> yeah. Supposedly it's pronounced Foyt, which I don't know how you get to that from the way his name is spelled. But That's me, really. I hear I am talking about like staying, playing to the height of your intelligence and comedy. And I'm like, nah, I'm going to say his name Fucked. <laughs> Yeah, it's no. I'm like a 10 year old boy, <laughs> but I'm coming for you, white authoritarian evangelical men. But that's the what it was Mel Brooks who talked about making the producers, right? And fragile authoritarians, the worst thing you could do is laugh at them. Baby. So that's, yeah, that's why you, there's the whole narrative of why men don't think women are funny. Right. The number one fear of women is violence from men. The number one fear of men is being laughed at by women. <laughs> and yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Really good point, Blake. I like that. I like that. <laughs> really good point. As much as I like fancy myself, like I, I've been going to this gym and my goal is to be able to do a pull up this year and I'm working on all the strength training and stuff. And I'm like, Ooh, as much as I'd like to get into a physical altercation with some of these guys <laughs> and be like, I'm going to beat them up. There's a girl at my gym that's so strong. I'd always just stare at her body and think about if I had the strength that she has, the muscles that she has, how I really wouldn't use them for good. I would just be the most <laughs> obnoxious, terrible person. <laughs> I'm like, I guess that makes me just as bad as these guys that I'm like, actually, I want to fist fight these authoritarians. But you're right. You're right. Laughing at them is so much it's so much better. It's so much better. It's do you so... get, on that note, do you get, evangelicals aren't known for their sense of humor. Like they, they get, for as much as they throw around things like snowflakes, they'll, you know, a lot of times they can't laugh at themselves for sure. Yeah. So do you get, what's that reaction? Like, I know that you, you get a lot of good feedback that people relate to the comedy that you make, but do you get the other side of some sort of either online vitriol or anything or worse. Uh, the, worst with regards... I've, I've, the worst online vitriol I've ever had was when I, when I did an episode where my son day, my character's son day came on the podcast. And this was when I was really angry right after Roe was overturned. And I <laughs> did an episode about God being the most prolific abortionist known to man oh and, and, all, and did all these Bible verses of how much God, obviously old Testament, but how much God loves ripping babies out of pregnant bellies and stuff. And wow, I really got it on that one. That one really, mm -hmm. that one really scared me. But I, I think m most of the feedback we get is good, but it's so surprising to me that ha I think we were shooting for comedy nerds as our audience. And that what we ended up hitting in terms of an audience was like half ex-evangelicals and half the people who still identify as Christian, but who are progressive and trying to dismantle some of the harm from the inside, which really surprises me. The McLarens and the, the people who are like a lot, I hear from a lot of pastors who are like, we have an inclusive church that is still looking to Bible for good stuff, but we are welcoming to the queer community and all of this and trying to reduce harm and everything. Right. I'm always mm -hmm. like, I'm amazed that any Christians like our podcast because I'm like, you do hear what we're saying, but I'm maybe it's heartening to hear that there are those types out there, man, because I am guilty of throwing the baby out with the bathwater and maybe baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's, it's really cool to, to hear how the show has developed in the ensuing years since we last talked and to hear your own development. And so it's, I, you, 
I just have a feeling that you're in an interesting position as someone who's gone through this this process that we all call deconstruction, or that's sort of what we've most mostly landed on. You've deconstructed, you're going through that process continually, but then you also have this character that you're that's in it at a different space than you are, and it, to hold both of those together has to be very, very interesting and give you a lot of sort of insights into into how you maybe you once believed and now yeah. uh, the compare and contrast has yeah. to be <laughs> yeah uh, pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> how are you doing before we go? How are you doing? How would you describe where you are right now, knowing that it's just a kind of wherever you find yourself on the continuum and that you never put your foot in the same river? How are you doing? Are you doing okay? Yeah. Yeah. I would say for as far as belief and that sort of thing, in like when I shortly after we started the I after I started the podcast, my family and I started going to an Episcopal parish and we were a part of that for years. And then when during the pandemic we moved we moved. So that ended that local church relationship yeah. and we haven't really found anything. And and it's not something that we're necessarily looking for at the moment and um, like something's missing not in that respect uh, it's been it was hard to relocate during a pandemic when we we were very careful for our family and everything mm -hmm. and so even making the one thing one thing that a lot of churches have going for it is that can be as ready-made fr friend groups yeah and for sure. that is still a skill i'm trying to figure out how to yeah. how to develop outside of a church context uh, which is difficult. But by and large, for me, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I remain interested in people's stories of like, why, how and why they change their minds. And that's really, that's really the animating thing for me. It's not necessarily trying to understand the mind of some, the ineffable mind of God or something like that. It's more knowing people's stories and also trying to understand how some of these the role that these institutions play in propagating them. In 2020, I did a spinoff podcast of my own called Powers and Principalities. And so I, I, inter I interviewed a lot of folks and it was about white evangelicalism and white Christian nationalism. So I talked to Kristen Cobus dume and Anthea mm. Butler and mm. Jeff Charlotte and a whole bunch of other people. And so like I'm expanding my work there, but by and large, the thing that the way I understand this show now is like this show is for people who may be starting off in their own process of leaving evangelicalism or questioning it and then wanting to know the stories of people who may be at a different stage or may have made different choices. Yeah. Because over my shoulder here, like the idea is that something died, but many things have bloomed from it and that there's lots of different paths. And to me, I understand ex evangelical over time has accumulated, especially if you're extremely online. I used to be very extremely online. I'm not as much anymore. Over time, it's developed its own. It, some people may even think it's cringe and that's their prerogative. Like it's, it's developed its own reputation or what have you that other people or associations that other people may have, especially if they've been around for years. But I understand it. Use this as much as it's useful. You don't need this mm -hmm. to you don't, this was never intended to be a wholesale replacement for evangelicalism. It's just a way to understand a prior relationship. Yeah. So, um, and lovely. so for me, it's just, I'm more interested in those more human things than divine things. It's just yeah. not animating to me. It's not, I have to set that down for now. Yeah. I'm open for it coming back. I'm open to I would say to that degree, I'm agnostic. It's yeah. not a statement of non-belief is as binding as a statement of belief to me. So that's where I am right now. <laughs> that's, that's, thank you for sharing that with me. That's really cool. I related to that. I, this week was watching a lecture from, oh, uh, what is his name? It's hard for me to remember because it's, what is his, oh, hold on. I have to look up his name really quick. A man named Bio. Akamolafe, I can, I don't know if I'm saying it, but I was listening to a lecture by him this week that I had to watch for my embodied sexuality class. And mm -hmm. he started referencing the story of Job. And I was like, hey, 
dang, why the gang get And then I start getting all, I got my own thoughts about that story. I know that story. And I just noticed how I'm just triggered by my religious trauma. That's a trigger for me is that he's doing a Bible reference in this lecture that's about something else. And I, and so I recognized that and I was like, okay, let me like overcome that because my mind will flood with what was going on at the beginning of the story of Job where Satan is just sitting there hanging out with God and God's want to see how much this guy loves me. Watch this. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, Satan and God hang out. What is the, you know, all that stuff. I'm like I got to get to the bottom of that. And then I'm kind of like, do I? <laughs> yeah. But what, what he was referencing is that when Job, and maybe this is some of the baby part when you take out all the like toxic, sick stuff from the Bible bathwater. But he was talking about how when Job asked God, like, why suffering? Why mm -hmm. the human suffering? That God was like, have you considered the, and he just went into, and again, I know I'm using all these male pronouns and stuff, but I'm just like doing it the way the, you know, what, but he was like, referencing nature and thunderstorms and a fawn and all of those things. And if you move away from the taking the Bible literally stuff, which hurt me and, yeah. and get into some of the symbolism, I'm like, Oh wow, there is cool symbolism there of yeah. why human suffering. And the answer that this speaker bio was like saying is the answer was wonder like, and to be bewildered with the beauty. And I am getting to that part too of, oh, wow, yeah, gratitude does extinguish that anxiety that I spin out with. And so trying to, that was a commandment of from the Bible of stay in a constant state of gratitude. Oh, wow, that baby in the bathwater, that's good. <laughs> and there is good in there. Yeah. But I do, I was really struck by, Bio's thinking about that of why human suffering, we can take the Bible literally, and I don't think it makes a lot of sense or nor does it have good answers for why human suffering. But if you take it symbolically, that thing of like, why human suffering? And the answer of, hey, tap into the, the wonder. That's what's happening too with becoming embodied is, oh, wait, maybe the whole point of this is for me to have a human experience b before yeah. the before humanity is extinguished by AI, <laughs> have the human experience, yeah. have the sex, eat the food, hold your friend's hand, do the thing, look at the thunderstorm. I guess mushrooms taught me that too. Mushrooms eat dead things and transform them into new life. And then when you put mushrooms, at least psilocybin mushrooms on your brain, they help transform some like dead thoughts and transform them into like new aliveness. And and the, and mushrooms have taught me that too. Of Hey, if you are present and look at what is around you right now, your mouth will fall open. <laughs> you look at it, it, it's, we laugh yeah. at people on mushrooms because we're like, oh, you're just looking at a leaf and being like, this is awesome. But if you really do sit with a leaf, it's pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> oh, like you sit with a fractal leaf of a fern and the next thing you know, you're like, oh, I think I've reached the nexus of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That I think that is a very good gratitude and wonder and reverence. Like those things don't, the fundamentalism doesn't lay claim to those things there. Yeah. They can yeah. be accessed. There's other, good point. in as much as, in as much as we were taught that no one comes to the father or that sort of thing. It's just not true. It doesn't pan out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's so many, and I'm not, I know I'm not here to yuck other people's yums. And so if that, if you can find that in a form of Christianity, that's not harmful to someone else or to yourself, then that's good. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I will continue to be vocal about <laughs> the yeah. harmful things in Christianity that I, yeah. that I find. And, and that's, and to, that's my birth. That's, there's a David Bazan song called People. And he's, these are my people. And he, it's what, mm. it's a very prophetic song. Mm. I think he wrote in 2011 or published in 2011. And uh, that song yeah. really gets to it. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways. And um, Blake, if I may give you a little word of encouragement or th that's the intention of it is I'm really grateful for this talk that we had. I really appreciate it. And I do find healing and connecting with people like you. And I really respect your 
um, the way you carry yourself in the world. And yeah, I thank really you. like you and I really appreciate this opportunity to have this talk and I'm really grateful yeah. for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really do. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming back on the show to talk about to talk about Mega and the upcoming rise and fall of Twin Hills. Oh, Is there anything let me uh, talk about it? <laughs> anything else that that you want to plug here before we say goodbye to the listeners? <laughs> uh-huh. I think that's it. I have a website which is just my name, hollylaurent.com and I've got lots of like essays and stuff on there and podcast stuff and whatever, but Mega the podcast is in a website too where we have like merch and live shows and all the stuff there and yeah, keep an eye out for Rise and Fall of Twin Hills because I'm really I really want to find an audience for that because yeah, Rise and Fall of Mars Hill had such a massive audience. I think mm-hmm. people are are interested in that. I was so surprised that was done by Christianity Today and mm-hmm. now going by CT, which also I'm like, what's that about? Did oh yeah, think that's like that's a, is a bad word now. That's a known that's a but, known quantity. Different like Campus Crusade for Christ is now Crew, C R U, and what's the other one? There was another one. I can't, there was a missionary organization that, that did that too. And I'm blanking on it in the moment, but yeah, it's a, it's a type. It's, have you heard of the Jesus juke? Like when someone brings up Jesus, like they, it's like the opposite of that. (laughs) (laughs) It's like they're them trying to be sneaky. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That kind of says it all right there. Really. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure it'll find an audience and that I'll be sure to be able to find the link to mega and everything else in the show notes. Holly, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Blake. I really appreciate your time. It's been so nice. I really, I'm awful grateful. Me too. Thank you for coming on. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe in the podcast player of your choice. You can also rate and review the show wherever you find ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And you can subscribe to the newsletter, the Post Evangelical Post, over at postevangelicalpost.com. Exvangelical is a production of the Post Evangelical Post LLC and a member of the Reverend Media Group Podcast Collective. Thank you very much. Talk soon. 1 Corinthians warned you about the women with a loud mouth, and this podcast is just that. Here at the Speaking in Church podcast, we talk all about the regular people and the things that regularly happen to them in the evangelical church. It's a podcast about change, it's a podcast about seeking moral high ground, and it's a podcast for people who are just trying to deconstruct on the safe side. You can listen wherever you get your podcast, and if you want to be a guest, yes, you, regular person, you can be a guest on the Speaking in Church podcast. If you want to come on, just let us know.